literature by Samila Herath. Today I have got another poem in store for you under the theme conflict War is Kind by Stephen Cray. War. What do you think of war? War is, I know, a gloomy reality. It's a grim reality. People, that means the poets and writers, they have taken this subject war in two different aspects. Some of them have thought of war as a positive factor where they celebrate war and romanticize with war. They think of the warriors and uh, battles as something positive. They talk of heroism, they talk of patriotism, they talk of glory and they talk of pomp and pageantry of war. While the others who think that war is negative, they highlight the suffering of war, waste of life and waste of materials and also they emphasize on the futility of war. Before I start the poem today, I like to set you a task, a small task. Think of the word war and think of what words come to your mind in connection with the word war. I'm going to give you three seconds. One, two, three. Now shall we check the things that come to my mind, the words that come to my mind? Painful, suffering, pathetic, horrible, sorrowful, brutal, inhuman, grim, fearsome, disastrous. So we won't be able to stop if we continue. There may be so many words. So many words must have come to your mind. But I would like to present you another word. Kind. Can you use the word kind to talk of war? It sounds absurd, isn't that so? But our poet today, Stephen Crane, has used that word, kind. He says, war is kind. Why? It sounds absurd, unusual. So he has used this word, kind. I think the poet has used this word, kind, war is kind, to emphasize the cruelty of war. He is talking in this sense of war to highlight irony in that word, in that phrase. He is bringing in an antithesis here. So, uh, we are going to first look into the life of the poet, why he has taken war in this aspect through this poem. He has been a reporter of war, so he has had so many first-hand experiences of war. With these experiences, he had touched on this poem. So we look into his life story quickly. This 19th century American poet was considered the most gifted writer of his generation who followed the realist tradition by writing on contemporary everyday life as they truly appear. He was a prolific writer who produced a large number of works and innovative as his works are rich in originality and creative thinking. Now let's start with the analysis of the poem. Before that, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the poem itself. This poem consists of five stanzas you must have noticed by now and it has got 26 lines and it focuses on the emotional loss of near and dear ones of the warring soldiers at one point and at the other point the poem focuses on the refusal of war a strong it is a strong denial of war it emphasizes on the savagery of war and its inherent cruelty with that knowledge we are going to start the analysis with stanza one the stanza one says 
Do not weep, maiden, for war is kind, because your lover threw wild hands towards the sky, and the affrighted steed ran on alone. Do not weep, war is kind. It's the first stanza. It is an address to a maiden, an unmarried young girl. So the poet here calls this young girl and tells her not to weep. Why? Why is, he, why is she asked not to weep? Because the poet says, war is kind. So that antithesis is presented here at the very beginning of the poem where the reader is struck where the reader is uh, is found himself in a kind of uh, doubtful situation whether this poet is saying the truth or not so here we understand the tone he is forwarding us the tone of irony is presented here so this unusual, absurd and ironical presentation of war by saying that it is kind is forwarded to us by the confrontation of a lover. Here the poet confronts a lover and tells the lover not to weep. Why is she weeping? Because her lover seems to have died. Her lover must certainly be a soldier in the battlefield and he had met his unfortunate death at the battlefield. So that is the first stanza. With that we'll move on to the second stanza. In the second stanza the picture becomes really different. Here we not only meet a single person, we are open to the, we are made open to the picture of a battlefield. Here it is, it is like a film. The battlefield is unveiled in, in front of our eyes like in a film. The poet says in the second stanza, horse booming drums of the regiment, little souls who thirst for fight, these men were born to drill and die. The unexplained glory flies above them. Great is the battle God, great and his kingdom. A field where a thousand corpses lie. Here I have made a slight change which is different from the structure of the poem. I have added the first line of the third stanza to this second line I am now discussing with you. Because the first line of the third stanza has a connection to the second stanza which we call the run-on technique. It is for the purpose of late analysis. So here the poet is bringing us the picture of the battlefield. Did you see? Is it a nice picture? Is it a pleasant picture? No it is not at all. So here the poet is emphasizing on the sounds of drums. What are these sounds of drums? These are the drums which are being played to uplift the morale of the soldiers, to give him a kind of a strong spirit, a strong kick to these soldiers to go forward to confront the enemy, to meet the enemy. So the poet says these sounds of the drums are hoarse. What, are, what is hoarse? Hoarse means rough. It is not a pleasant sound. How can be a sound that invites you to woe? Uh, can it be pleasant? No, it cannot be. So these hoarse uh, sounds of the drums of the regiment. Regiment is a troop of soldiers. So this regiment consists of little saws. Who are these little saws? Little saws are the soldiers. Why are these soldiers called as little saws? Saws, they are thirsty for fight, the poet says. So why little saws? Little saws means they are pitiful men. They are, they, are, uh, they are helpless because they 
carry their destiny in hands which which is controlled by the others their destiny is in the hands of the others who are these others others are the high ranking officials others are the politicians so they have this uh, destiny in their hands uh, and the soldiers do not have any control of their own wishes their wish is the wish of the country their wish is the wish of the politicians their wish is the wish of the high ranking officials that's why they are pitiful they are helpless and not only that they are to they are born to drill and die they are born to drill and die what do you mean by that so these soldiers who are born as human beings the poet says they are born to do this to do what to drill and die drilling means to practice practice what practice warring practice fighting practice killing each other so they have got themselves practice for this particular job and their ultimate is to die and sacrifice their lives for the sake of the country so that is their task there is no other task in this world for them except this particular task of drilling and dying so do you agree with this view it gives us a big question mark isn't that so are there any human beings in this world who are born to fight and die and that's a doubt and the point does not st uh, stop there the poet goes on talking about another thing he's talking about the unexplained glory flies about them what is this glory glory is the honor prestige honor prestige of what honor of what prestige of the victory of war prestige of fighting for your own land so people talk about this prestige people talk about this glory so can there be any glory in warring whatever the purpose is so uh, maybe the purpose is to protect your own land maybe the purpose is to protect your own people of the country whatever the purpose is warring includes killing of other human beings so how can you glorify this action so that is why the poet says this glory is unexplained it is difficult to understand it is difficult to make others understand also so that is why it is unexplained and stephen crane says this glory flies about them who are them the mother soldiers who go to the battle front who has the bravery valor and vigor to go to the battle front and meet the enemy so that is not an easy task you have to forget about your own life if you are to go to the battle front so these soldiers do not catch this glory then this glory is not in their reach it flies above them why because this glory ultimately goes to the high ranking officials of the of the army of the military and not only to the high ranking officials the politicians who rule the country so while the glory is being grabbed by them these innocent soldiers these pitiful soldiers are forgotten that is the reality of this type of wars we have seen in our history not only in sri lanka in the entire world at this point i remember a poem written by uh, bertolt brecht in the name a worker reads history there he talks about the great conqueror alexander you must have heard of him so in this poem uh, bertolt brecht asks was there not even a cook in his army so that sh that shows how ironical this situation is was alexander the great 
was not supported even, a, even by a cook in the time of his warring? So this was the ironical question asked by Bertolt Brecht because it was only this great conqueror Alexander the Great is remembered throughout the world uh, through the entire history, not the other innocent soldiers who had fought with him. So this is the grim reality of war. That is why the poet says the unexplained glory, the glory itself is unexplained and this glory flies above the soldiers. Soldiers are unable to capture and reach this glory. They are forgotten after the war. That's the reality. And then he moves on to the concept of uh, battle gods, concept of battle god. So in different cultures, we have uh, different people worship battle gods. In Roman mythology, it is Mars. And in Greek mythology, Ares. In Hindu mythology also, you get Skander. So here, Vo is given a sacred aspect by each and every culture if you study different cultures around the world. So this sacred aspect is also being laughed at by Stephen Crane here in this line. He says, great is the battle god. So these battle gods are great. They are worshipped. They are being, uh, they are treated as holy. But still, look at their kingdoms. What about the kingdom of the battle god? The kingdom is a field where a thousand corpses lie. Corpses, dead bodies. So even in their kingdoms, there are thousands and thousands of dead bodies. So how can you say, woe is sacred? So that is what he questions to the second stanza. Okay, now we'll move on to the third stanza. Third stanza says, Do not weep, babe, for war is kind, because your father tumbled in the yellow trenches, raged at his breast, gulped and died. Do not weep, war is kind. We see a connection between the first stanza and the third stanza. First stanza, it was a maiden being addressed, and in the third stanza, a babe, a babe, a young child, most probably a young daughter. So this young daughter is also crying. Why? Because her father had died in the war as the lover of the maiden in the same manner. So here a different kind of a death is being presented. How had the father died? The father had tumbled in the yellow trenches. Trenches are ditches, drains, uh, which, they, uh, which they prepare as a strategy of war. Actually, this is a reference for the First World War. Uh, I think that you know about the First World War, uh, which lasted uh, from 1915 to 1918. So there, their uh, main war strategy had been uh, this use of trenches. So it was said, it is said that the soldiers of the First World War had suffered a lot because there had been diseases and sicknesses inside these trenches because they had stayed inside these trenches continuously, months after months, even uh, at the time of winters. Right. So here these trenches, why is the color yellow? Uh, imprinted here, yellow is often associated with sickness and disease. So it refers to the unsanitary, uh, unsanitary trenches, ditches filled with sick and dying soldiers. So this father of this young babe had fallen down into one of these yellow trenches and he had raged at his breast. He had angrily touched his breast, maybe angry, uh, angry uh, of the enemies, maybe angry of his fate, maybe angry of the war itself. So he had angrily raged at his breast and gulped, swallowed with difficulty and died. 
So that was the unfortunate death that this young soldier of a father had embraced in the battlefield. So when the news reaches the young baby, she starts to cry and our Stephen Crane, the poet says, don't cry baby, voice kind. How ironical it is. Okay, we'll go to the next stanza, stanza four. Once again, you are presented with that cinematic effect of war. Once again, the battlefield. Here he says, swift blazing flag of the regiment, eagle with crest of red and gold. These men were born to drill and die. Point for them the virtue of slaughter, make plain to them the excellence of killing. What's that? Once again, he is ironically touching uh, the pomp and pageantry of war. He is being very sarcastic towards the people who celebrate and romanticize war. So the poet says, swift blazing flag of the regiment. Each and, re each and every regiment has their own flag. So here the flag is swift. Swift means speed. How come the flag becomes swift? because the soldiers are carrying the flag and running, approaching towards the enemies, approaching towards the enemy troops, attacking. That's why the flags are speed. And while they are running towards their enemies, these flags are blazing in the sunshine. They are shining in the sunshine. So, in these flags, you get the crest of eagle. Eagle, we know, is a very powerful symbol. Eagle is the symbol of vigilance, symbol of uh, strength. So these things are there. And it is being painted with the colors gold and red. So these two colors are also symbolical of red, symbolical of blood, and gold, symbolical of, once again, glory. How come blood and glory go together? They are in par here. They are in par. So go, uh, blood and on, honor, how can they go together? Once again, a doubt for us. Blood will never bring you honor. But here in the battlefield, it is treated so. That is the irony, irony of it. And then another reference, these men. Who are these men? Once again, the soldiers repeating the same idea, born to drill and die. Point for them, explain to them the virtue of slaughter. Slaughtering is killing. Virtue, goodness of killing. Explain them that killing is good and make plain to them, make them understand uh, killing is excellent. Do you agree? Is slaughtering good? Is killing excellent? No, we vehemently reject it. How can you say yes to this? But the poet says this because this is the myth that we have within us. Because if uh, the war is being forwarded, if it is being conducted in the protection of one's nation, we say that it is sacred. We say that it is essential. We say that it is patriotism. And so these killings are justified just because they are done for the sake of your country and for the sake of the people of the country. So that is one attitude of these wars. But anyway, we should not let these things happen. So I again remember another war poem this time written by a poet called Wilfred Owen. So he says in one of his world famous poems, which has a Latin title called Dulce et Decorum Est, uh, he says it is a lie. So the, uh, the idea of this uh, line is it is sweet and fitting to die for one's own country. So he says in this poem, this idea is a total lie. It's a complete myth. So if you find time, 
the poems I have referred to, find them and go to them for some extra knowledge. So the poet says here in this stanza, it is a complete myth. There is no virtue of slaughtering. There is no excellence in killing. So we'll move on to the last stanza now, stanza 5. Once again, a different picture, an individual is forwarded here. And a field where a thousand corpses lie. Mother, whose heart hung humble as a button on the bright splendid shroud of your son. Do not weep, woe is kind. This time, it is the mother who is being addressed. First, the lover, maiden. Secondly, a baby girl. And thirdly, a mother. So, this time, the mother is not asked not to weep. Why? Because his, her son, the young son, uh, is killed in the battle, in the war. So, here, once again, that brutal, sympathetic, uh, pathetic picture of the uh, battlefield is forwarded. A battlefield with thousand corpses lying. So, here, the mother, mother's heart, Mother's heart resembles what? Mother's heart is the very symbol of love towards her own children. So this mother's heart is hanging humble, is hung humble as a button. The simile used here as a button of what? Button of the bright splendid shroud of her son. Shroud is the cloth with which you cover the dead body. Here this cloth, this dress will say, this dress is not just an ordinary dress. It is a bright splendid dress. Why? Because the soldiers who die at the battlefront are given a ceremonial funeral, a ceremonial burial. They are dressed with very significant um, pompous dresses with all the medals and everything. Uh, in their final journey and that's how they are buried. So this uh, mother's heart is just like a simple button of that pomp and pageantry of war. Why a simple button? It is so insignificant. Amidst this pomp and pageantry, amidst this glory of war, this button is so ins insignificant. What is this button? Button is the heart of the mother. Heart represents the love of mother. So this button is the love of mother. That means this emotion called love, attachment, connection, relationship is the, the this these emotions are so insignificant on the face of violence, on the face of war. That is what the poet is trying to convey us to this simile and this grandeur of woe which is being created to the bright splendid shroud of the dead body. So, uh, and finally the poet says, do not weep, woe is kind. So that is how the poem ends here. And did you notice children, so within these five stanzas, the first stanza, the third stanza and the fifth stanza are addressings of, uh, sorry, addressings to three different individuals, a maiden, a babe and the mother. So they, they are the indirect victims of war while the soldiers who go to the battlefront are the direct victims of war. So both these direct victims and indirect victims are suffering when you are involved in a war. I think more than the direct victims, they, get, they actually get the physical suffering, mental suffering as well. These indirect victims suffer more because they don't know what is happening there. They don't know whether their loved ones are still living. They don't know at which moment they, are, they will breathe their last in front of this violence of war. 
So both these sets are suffering. And through these three images of the lover, the babe and the mother, the poet is trying to tell us the antithesis of what he ironically says in the second and the fourth stanzas of the poem. He ironically says in these two stanzas, soldiers are little souls and soldiers are born to drill and die. So he is conveying the antithesis of these two phrases. If they are little souls, if they are born to drill and die, how come they be a lover of a young girl? How come they be a father of a young baby? How come they be a son of a mother? They are also human, humans under the uh, roughness of the uniform. We find another human being, another one of us inside this um, inside this rough uniform, under these medals, behind the gun. So we'll, we have to understand this reality. Who else? Is he only a father? Is he only a lover? And is he only a son? No, we have other connections as well. He can be our cousin. He can be our friend. He can be our brother. He can be, if, if we don't have any relationships, any relationship with these people, he can be another human being, just like uh, us. He's one of us. So we have to understand this reality. So there is no person who is born to this world to drill warring and to get killed in the battle front. You have to understand this. So therefore, we have to reject war. So that is one thing the poet is conveying us. And on the other hand, the poet conveys us the grim realities of war, how dangerous, how pathetic, how gruesome war is. The true picture of the battlefront is forwarded to us by the second and the fourth stanzas. So here we have, uh, this, uh, here we have, had the discussion completely and in my next video clip we'll be digging deeper into this poem by analyzing the devices and focusing on the themes. Goodbye.